Mike, can we begin? Uh, I'm all set. Okay. So, uh, based on our discussion at the end of the day yesterday, where we talked about DMP and DEP, uh, Bern and I put together, uh, I think, most of our comments in the format of say um, yeah the outline that that Bern had put together and, and talked to us about yesterday so uh, here is what we came up with last night for DMP and we'll go through DEP as well so the the six characteristics that we would like to have as a template for each of the phthalates as we go through are Adverse effects, and under that we have animal, human, relevance to humans, weight of evidence, risk to humans, and under weight of evidence, experimental and replication, risk to humans, exposure and hazard, and then five is our recommendation. Six, would this recommendation, if implemented, affect exposure of children to, in this case, DMP? And we asked is this a format that we could use to nicely and precisely summarize uh, our thoughts for each phthalate and precisely come to a recommendation in this case we say no action for DMP so let's go through this so adverse effects may I start oh, before then yes My expectation is that these recommendations, this page of recommendations is something that will be copied and quoted and whatnot. And the last thing we would want is to have a misinterpretation of what chemical we were talking about. So I would recommend that we, this is not the place for abbreviations alone, that we would use the full name of the chemical and the common abbreviation that we use throughout our report and then perhaps the cast number. Is the cast number an internationally recognized yeah. identifier? So uh, uh, my suggestion would be that we should have the cast number on these pages for each one of the chemicals so that if somebody is more used to going by cast number than an abbreviation, we have that as another backup for proper identification of the chemical that we're talking about. It's not going to take us much more time to put that on these reports. Okay, so under adverse effects, uh, animal studies, uh, reproductive, uh, no studies available. Developmental, there's the Gray et al. 2000 single dose study, 750 milligrams per kilogram per day, found no alteration in sexual differentiation or male reproductive tract development. So that's a concise summary of what was found. B, human, uh, no studies available. And again, Please correct me if anything I say we've said here is not correct or needs to be amended. So that's the, yes. Just a, just a question which <clears throat> has an impact on, on uh, well, sometimes there are effects observed in, in experimental studies where whether they are judged uh, adverse or not is, is a matter for debate. Um, should we, I mean, with most of the, the endpoints we're discussing here, this debate is rather philosophical. But uh, should we, maybe in the annex, um, have somewhere a section where we reflect on, on the adversity of various effects that, that we consider? For example, uh, just to, to illustrate this, uh, uh, years ago there was a debate about among... Um, uh, toxicologists not very familiar with endocrine disruption, whether something like changes in anogenital index would be classed as adverse. Now, the understanding of that has uh, progressed, and we now know that this is a biomarker for insufficient uh, androgen action in the rat in fetal life. So, 
and with everything that hangs on it. So in this context, AGD is now judged in a, in a fairly clear way, but that hasn't been so always. So therefore, uh, I don't think it, the, the right place for this is now in these recommendations, but we would need a section somewhere where this is clearly explained, what, what we class as adverse. Agree. Do you and, agree? And that is in the 30-page document that, ah, right. okay. that I will have to write for developmental talks and burn for reaper talks, and maybe we'll have to have that a combined section. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, we have to sort that out later, but you're absolutely right. But I think <clears throat> we shouldn't confuse no wells with no ales, and we have tried to standardize that what we're reporting from the studies is that was what the authors and us would agree is a no ale. Mm -hmm. But there are times where the scientific community changes its mind, and we have to be tuned into those. But for use with the hazard index approach, I'm assuming that we would always be using the no ale, not a no L. But where, where we need to explain this, we, we need to. Okay. Um, the second point, relevance to humans. Um, here, um, because we have no uh, human studies, we just have animal studies minimal, um, I th we would, I think, go to the default position and say animal studies assume to be relevant. It may seem to be semantic, but <clears throat> I think it's good for us to document what our choices are in some of these categories to achieve consistency from one to another. And in my experience with this in dealing with other kinds of reports, there are three, three choices when you talk about relevance. It's either assumed to be relevant, or it's known to be relevant, or known to be irrelevant. So I would encourage that we not invent further categories unless we absolutely need to. But we then to be consistent from one to the other, we should use that term. Yeah, and those, those would need to be defined up front in that 30-page document somewhere. Yeah. And then the third point is weight of evidence. So there under A is experimental design. And um, again, we would uh, have to find this up front as well. Um, here we have a, a single dose study, uh, which is not suitable for risk assessment. And B, replication is another issue. Uh, and no, we do not have replication. It's one study. Under point four, risk to humans. Under A, exposure is low. And, and we would refer C table in under hazard index in the, in the report or some such reference. B, hazard, um, unknown. Minimal data do not demonstrate hazard. Please jump in if you wish to make a comment or so, f yes. Uh, could, could I suggest to call this heading uh, uh, risk assessment considerations uh, rather than risk to human. Risk to human sounds uh, frighteningly focused. Often we uh, risk assessment consideration sounds a bit more flexible. Risk assessment considerations or something like that. He's always misbehaving these days. Tell me that in school. <laughs> oh, yes. Risk assessment considerations. <laughs> no wonder we get along. <laughs> okay. So that's better, risk assessment considerations? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's better. 
So going then to five recommendation, we said no action. Mm -hmm. Again, we would define up front what our choices are in terms of recommendations. And six, would this recommendation, if Im implemented, affect exposure of children to DMP? And we said no. I don't like the way that that's framed. And that, we, we took that verbatim from what someone said yesterday, because, but we're willing because to. Because there may be others where Well, how, how are you going to define effect exposure? You know, if, well, is it a 1% change I, I, or I, 10 I, that well, would determine? You see, again, we're back to the issue of total exposure versus from toys, which is our charge. Would this change affect um, exposure? Maybe. Would it affect, not for this particular one. There, there could be considerations for others, like, you know, total exposure could affect children. Exposure in toys may not affect children if it's much less less than one percent. But, so but how, we could we could qualify uh, that right well, here. Okay, that's what I'm saying is that we have to. I think we have to subcategories in that because that gets back to the point. I think Bernard and I talked about yesterday when before we left. So we got to be, we got to remember the charge, but we got to also remember other situations. Actually, the, the word no here is not enough because no is not answering the question because there is no action. So I think it would be more clear just to say it, no action was recommended. So the question of whether it's going to result in a reduction of exposure of children is a moot point because there was no action recommended that would affect it. Yeah. Not applicable? And Bern, you just used the word reduction in exposure. I mean, would you want to make that more specific and say would this reduce? Might we recommend some actions that would result in greater exposure? Good, theoretically. Theoretically. Mm. For example, there's the other example that we'll look at, <clears throat> the recommendation was to do more research, to gather more information. That, that by itself won't result in a reduction of exposure, but it could eventually. So I'm not sure what question we're answering here. But I, I guess the term effect exposure, we would need to define that. Because, Give it a direction. Well, direction and and also, I mean, if, if so, 1% change in effect is, you know, it, it, it would almost be like in Epidemiology, if you say, is there an association, you ignore any statistical testing or confidence limits. If it's 1.01, the answer is yes. It's not 1.00, the null. There's an effect. Whether it's meaningful or important is a different question, right? I mean, because <clears throat> that's basically asking the question, is, is the effect different than zero? Right, when you say, it, does it affect exposure? That we're guessing. But yeah, that's the point. I think we're guessing. So we're going to qualify any of these answers to that question. But we could say, would this recommendation, if, if implemented, be expected to reduce exposure of children to DMP? Can't guarantee that it will, but do we expect that it would? That's the reason we're taking this action. Expected. I think we could say, would this recommendation, if implemented, be expected to reduce exposure of children to this phthalate? Does that so get at? Be expected to? Be expected to. That's more specific. It turns out that it doesn't. I mean, we also don't know what is a, how much reduction does there have to be before it becomes significant. Or important or... I, I think we, we could go on record of saying that we expect that this action will reduce exposure. Otherwise, why would we take it? Again, there's going to be the issue of if we take an action on 
charge, meaning the toys, would we expect it to reduce exposure relative to the total exposure, which is have to um, address? I mean, you, you, it's it's very complicated because you know we haven't got the results yet back from the kids, but some of the results we've already seen in preliminary analyses suggest that. And I think for, it's really important, Paul, that in your section in the 30 page that you discuss this in detail. Oh, I, I will. Yeah, that, that you lay out those issues. Yeah. Because they are they're significant issues. Yep. I mean, it's like saying, you know, you know we, have, we have toxins in everything, we have arsenic in drinking water. Arsenic always in drinking water in New Jersey. Do I ban kids from drinking? Pregnant women from drinking arsen water with arsenic in it, only if it's above a certain level, because getting rid of it is almost impossible because it's a natural compound. These are, these are really complicated issues because there are toxins everywhere. Chemical world. <clears throat> Would this be a good time? I've prepared something uh, to open this box uh, weight of evidence a little. Time or. Yeah, it's fine. You did a great job, guys. I, 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 I would have another question uh, regarding 4A exposure. We focused most of our discussion yesterday based on the MOE or MOS model. And this is not uh, implemented here. We say uh, C table and hazard index report. The hazard index itself is more designed to be the cumulative exposure part, while yesterday we focused our discussions on the margins of exposure or margins of safety. And we also uh, talked about current exposures and expected exposures. I think that's why I favored Sorry, this weighing up um, has to go has to go in there. I mean, in the case I agree with what uh, Bernd and uh, Phil have done. In the case of uh, of DMP, these considerations are fairly straightforward, but they've become more complicated with other phthalates. So we would have to fall back on the MOEs and take into account uh, anticipated changes in exposure patterns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All this comes. It's also a question for debate what kind of margins of exposure one would uh, e expect minimally to say, okay, negligible risk. But at least it gives us a, a, a box that we have to fill that in. Could I ask Andreas to say a bit more about what you mean by changes in exposure pattern? I mean, this is the, this is the issue I've been thinking about is my concern is is that when we make action on one chemical others are going to come up that we don't know as much about mm -hmm. um, do we need to have that kind of consideration in what we're talking about here I mean it may be that we don't know a, we have no idea what what the next you know chemical up to bat would be but uh, I, I don't like the idea of, of falling off the abyss you know you don't we make one action and there's something's going to happen yeah, we had this this yesterday uh, looking at the example of the IBP, where mm -hmm. it's not widely used apparently, but the, the exposure increases and we are already in the, the gray zone with the margin of exposure. So yeah, such considerations would then have to kick in. We had the same considerations regarding the INP. I didn't want to mention it just now. So does that mean we need to add another component to this sort of framework that says, you know, uh, what's the impact or what's the behavior pattern or what's the exposure changes or what's yeah. anticipated or do we know anything about what's anticipated? Yeah, I think we should handle this flexibly as and when it arises. I mean, the, the, this framework I think is good enough to allow us this flexibility. I mean, this, this has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. You wouldn't ask it as a final question? No. Because we Wait. may not know the answers. And, 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 and I think that's and, important to say, 
in these cases we <sighs> might anticipate this, in other cases we don't know. So you could be, it's, it's, it's not just the risk side of it, it's a risk benefit side. I mean, are we better off staying where we are in a case where it's, the margins are wide um, compared to what we don't know? I, that's the question I have. That's an interesting question that most people don't ask. Risk benefit considerations don't enter this at all. Uh, let's be very clear about that. That's beyond our area of expertise. We're not doing risk benefit considerations. Um, what are we doing, Michael? Risk assessment. No, let's no, not I'm, I'm ask, I'm a, no, no, I'm asking Michael about, you know, I, I know what you said, and, but it needs a context as to what we in, can and cannot do. Well, because it's I think point it's of risk, so the point of risk benefit was just raised, and I think it needs an airing. Well, we're, I, I don't think we're doing the, the what the we would normally do risk benefit, which is you know costs, right? Basically, but I think to consider you know substitutes. I mean, I think that's one of the uh, uh, part of the the charge is to consider substitutes, yep. and if you take away a phthalate and replace it with something else. Um, well, or to just to ask the question, if you take away this phthalate, what's it going to be replaced with? Is it going to be better or worse? I think in that sense, that's, okay. I think that's, so that's well within the charge. Because I, I was wondering from the standpoint of, of the replacement, since we hadn't really discussed it, and that is a consideration. And that's, I think, why that provision is in the, in the charge. So I misspoke calling it risk benefit. I, I agree with that. Right, right, yeah. More like unintended consequences. Ah, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Mike, because the, the CPSC is the primary customer of our report, if we follow this template for the rest of the chemicals, will CPSC consider us to have been responsive charge? Um, uh, yes, abs, abs, um, absolutely. I mean, you're you're going to going to go through this for uh, uh, the list of phthalates and the list of substitutes. So, I mean, yes, absolutely. To. Uh, Yes. Um, you, I think this will work from there. Right click. Our computer is great. They're fantastic. Okay, this is very, very briefly. Um, there are. There are a number of weight of evidence approaches, and in this area, um, there's no, no general consensus about what to do. And uh, uh, the complicating thing is also that the term weight of evidence is used with different meanings in different fields of study. So, but um, what, what is most useful to us is uh, to look at epidemiological criteria of causal inference, but with qualifications and uh, quality criteria for toxicological studies. So I take this in turn. The most uh, famous uh, 
criteria for causal inference in epidemiology are the Bradford Hill criteria. Um, uh, this, this arises out of a, out of a fireside conversation between Bradford Hill and uh, Doll. They were musing about uh, uh, when, when can we claim on the basis of epidemiological evidence that something is causally linked with certain disease outcomes. Uh, and that is because uh, the term causality in epidemiology is very complicated. Normally epidemiologists study associations, which is different. So they, they came up with these criteria, or Bradford Hill did. Uh, the, these are the ones we can briefly go through. Strength of the association, that, that's, a, that's a measure of the relative risk estimate. Consistency, is this uh, consistent across geographical, social, or temporal scales? For our purposes, this means, has it been reproduced? Specificity. Is this a specific association between exposure and disease? Temporality, evidence that exposure precedes disease. Uh, all, not all of these are totally applicable to us here, but I'll, I'll go to biological gradient. That's a, that's a word for uh, do we have any information about um, those response uh, uh, relationships? Plausibility is what we're looking at uh, plausible from a biological point of view, coherence with natural history and biology of the disease. What happens if, uh, if you can do an experiment where um, exposure is um, interrupted or seized totally? Well, then do we have a recovery effect? And then lastly, analogy, the consideration of the known effects of similar factors. So is there anything out there already uh, similar to the uh, exposure we're looking at where we know that uh, something uh, adverse happens? I mean, these are, these are the original Bradford Hill criteria. In practice, they are not all used uh, to, to judge the strengths of epidemiological evidence. Uh, there are some uh, variations. Uh, some criteria are left out and some are really not, not applicable. And there are only very rare cases where the full set uh, has actually been, been looked at or can be looked at. But that's, a, that's a guide for us, I think, to, um, to look at epidemiological evidence. Um, <clears throat> it has been used, for example, uh, by the WHO in their global assessment of uh, endocrine disruptors, which probably is the most useful application for us because we're, we're looking at phthalates. And there, I mean, uh, the, the original number of, of these criteria has been reduced somewhat, but it's, but it's still useful. And there's also um, further examples in the literature where people have tried to apply this to, to various hypotheses and questions, which uh, we could look at. But without going into further detail now. Very relevant to us is to judge the quality of toxicological studies, and here the most important bit are these uh, so-called Klimisch scores. Uh, this comes from a paper by Klimisch and colleagues published in 1997. I've put the reference down here. So they have uh, four criteria where they, this is all about judging uh, toxicological studies in the context of usefulness for, for, for making uh, uh, regulatory decisions. So the best is reliable without restriction, and uh, that generally applies to studies that conform to GLP or some other set of quality criteria. Now, we need to dwell on this a little. That there is a problem because uh, a blanket uh, application of the GLP criterion will kick out a lot of studies we are dealing with because uh, normally scientists do not apply GLP criteria, which is not to say that their studies are, are, are somewhat worse, but the way academic institutions are run is, is, is not amenable to implementing GLP. Now, the problem is that many regulators would, uh, would disregard any scientific studies and, uh, and kick them out. I don't think we can be, we can be that restrictive. Um, the other complicating factor is that uh, uh, Guideline studies, that, that, that's also, that's also um, a criterion to demand that uh, the uh, studies we are looking at have to conform to guidelines. I, think, I also think that's a bit dangerous in our case and too restrictive. 
Right, the next one is reliable with restriction. That applies to studies generally well documented and scientifically acceptable, but surely falling short of GLP in some measure. I think that would be a lot of the, the studies we're dealing with fall in, into that box here. Uh, these are just the original Klimisch scores. I'm just, re, you know, telling you about them. We, we, we can think about whether we take them as read or whether we modify them. Not reliable means method used are either insufficiently documented or unacceptable, and then not assignable where the documentation is insufficient for risk assessment. Of in many, in some situations, only an abstract is available. I don't think that really applies to us. But that, so this we could use as a guide, or, or. But the next one is. I think we also need to reflect and. Uh, um, Andreas, may I? Could yeah. you go back to the to the slide before that? Yeah. Klimisch and co-workers, they, um, of course, probably see these scores more from the industry perspective. Well, yes. And um, we know with the FEDATES, for example, that uh, many studies performed were thoroughly following GLP, but the guidelines, they were, let me put it this way, studies that followed the classical guidelines on f for phthalates were not dosing in the right exposure window. So from 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 looking at the this, the, the, the GLP side, they were fully uh, compatible. Mm. But we know that uh, the study approach was looking at the wrong exposure window or the the wrong timing. Yeah. So this is just. Hmm for, let's say, the GLP compliance, okay. nothing more. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, that's why I say we have to take the Klimisch scores with a pinch of salt. Y you're quite right, and that is the problem. You can have the most wonderful GLP study, which will give uh, totally inconclusive results. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to exercise judgment there and, and bear this in mind, and also, um, you know, often, okay, uh, guidelines does. You can adhere to certain guidelines, but from our knowledge about uh, the uh, toxicological context, we have, would have to conclude these guideline studies or these guidelines are inappropriate to show the effects we, we want to see. So we have to bear, that's what I meant, we have to bear all this in mind, but nevertheless, broadly speaking, I think the Klimisch scores um, are useful or we could, should keep them in mind or modify them probably for our purposes. But we also talked yesterday about having reproducible study, you know, studies with reproducible outcomes. Yeah. And yeah. Which is also a, an evaluation of quality that may not follow these guidelines, but it is something that we would sort of talked about. So we yeah, it seems that regulators look at this in a slightly different way. Uh, they, they, uh, they put more emphasis, it seems to me, on the quality of one study. So it is quite possible to make risk assessment uh, decisions on the basis of one study only, but if it's wonderful and well conducted, well documented, et cetera, et cetera, there's no problem with this. So the demand for having, uh, having the effect under consideration reproduced independently is uh, somewhat handled flexibly. You may prefer that. Well, if, if you can say that has been reproduced in several labs, that will strengthen uh, the case, uh, of course, and if it if that's the case, we should mention that. Yeah. So, uh, the quality here, the quality criteria here, apply not for the study design, but the performance of the study. No, the, no uh, and documentation, yes, performance as well. Yeah. Not the study design. <coughs> the design to a degree as well. <coughs> here, look. scientifically acceptable. Hmm. So what you're saying is that it may be, studies may be reliable, they may GLP, be GLP, but they may, act, may, they may not address the right questions. 
That's right, yes. We, we have that's the bottom line. That's, that's the bottom line of what you're trying yeah. to do, and I agree with it. Totally. Yeah. yeah, we have concrete examples for this. In sure. the past, there have been, and uh, we have uh, seen some of these studies uh, presented to us by industry representatives here, where they were wonderful, beautiful, uh, but sadly, um, exposure didn't take place in the period now recognized to be the vulnerable period, and therefore the results are totally inconclusive for our purposes. So, if, 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 I, I, want to take, if I want to take this farther, considering we have data gaps in many different arenas, that one of the recommendations could be that you know GLP is not enough. You need GLP plus an not plus you have to have your study design focus on the particular question or gap that we're trying to fill. Yeah, and that that's right. I think that would be a more than. In fact, I think that would be a very important recommendation. Yes, reduce yeah. the amount of waste of money and time and effort trying to <coughs> describe <coughs> and convince people about the adequacy of a study that doesn't answer the question. Yeah, I, I agree. This is but, but I think, sorry? It is also relevant, I mean, that comment to epidemiologic studies. I mean, there are studies that have been done in, let's say, an occupational setting, looking at an exposure and yeah. development of cancer, and you have five or ten years of follow-up, and it's, you know, a tumor that takes two decades to develop. Mm -hmm. The study could be adequately powered, designed, but you know, the follow-up period's not adequate yeah. for the exposure window, so it, which, which is which not leads really me, included which, in the Bradford yeah. Hill criteria. That's right, that's right. That lead me, leads me to the next slide. I think both Bradford Hill uh, criteria and Klimisch scores alone are not sufficient uh, for what, what, what we need to do. We have to judge the technical quality of So I, I try to uh, encapsulate this here, but only for experimental talk studies. Something similar would have to be done for epidemiology, but I didn't have the time to do this. So I, I try to express this in terms of requirements for deriving PODs. We already have a knowledge various studies were, that are not, were A, not designed to derive a point of departure, nor would these uh, would this mean, meet the quality criteria required for that? But these are, so uh, you can define this in terms of a minimum number of animals per dose group. So I think OECD guidance says uh, around 20. Uh, it has to be defined in terms of the number of dose groups. So single doses is a bit of a problem. You would want several. Uh, and it has to be defined in terms of control groups and how big they are and how well designed. Often you want to see a negative and a positive control. Uh, so there's more in OECD guidance about, about this. Uh, but I think that would be helpful for us. And something equivalent for epidemiology would have to be drawn up. But uh, I've reached the end of my, my competence there. So maybe Russ can step in. Uh, and that's uh, the end of this. Thanks. And I think in uh, my section of developmental talks, I developed criteria for how I selected studies that were acceptable for developing the well so and I think that needs to be expanded yeah. Yeah. okay so going on to DEP For DEP under the heading of adverse effects, there are more data on this chemical. 
first of all, there were regarding animal repro studies, there were two multi-generation reproductive studies, one in mice, it was a continuous breeding study protocol that showed an increased prostate weight, decreased sperm concentration, increased rates of abnormal sperm, and decreased number of live pups per litter at 4,500 milligrams per kilogram per day, and this is a study of lamb et al., 1987. And then a two-generation reproductive study in rats reported by Fiji, 2005, where rats were given 1 or 1.4 grams per kilogram per day. There were no effects on fertility or fecundity, but there were dose-related decreases in uterine weight and the number of gestation days. Were, both of those were affected and reported with a NOAL of 255 milligrams per kilogram per day. In the uh, reproductive in the developmental area, a study by Gray et al., 2000, a single, a single dose study of 750 milligrams per kilogram per day found no alteration in sexual differentiation or male reproductive tract development. But this is an example where a single dose study that might generally make you think that, well, this is a non contribution because it's a single dose. But in, in the case of Earl Gray's lab, this is in the context of a large number of studies that he's done, and he has zeroed in on 750 as a meaningful starting point. And if you don't see anything, then there's no need to waste resources on, on something that's not going to be productive. So there are times when a single dose study is contributing information and other times when it isn't. But this one, I think, is, is appropriate to bring to the front here. But it is the, the only observation that there is on DEP. And the human, and Bill and I talked about what is AGI, and it isn't clear to me, but maybe some of the rest of you can explain what AGI, what is AGI? means. In a general index, so so basically, what uh, Swan did in the in the 2005 paper <clears throat> is, since the infants were of different age and, of course, body size, you need to adjust oh, okay. for their weight in in some sense. Okay. And so she did that um, different. She calculated an a general index, which took that into account and used that as her outcome rather than the straight AGD. In the 2008 slightly larger analysis of the same cohort, she used AGD, but she calculated weight percentiles and then adjusted for that as a covariate, really, rather than so that basically the, the outcome measure was antigenal distance and AGI versus the 2008 analysis. It was just a different way of counting for body size. Okay, so then the, what, what we wanted to capture from that pair of studies was that the relevant endpoint was affected in both of these studies, decreased AGI associated with the urinary tract concentrations of MEP in the 05 study, and then the decreased AGD that's adjusted for weight percentiles associated with a higher urinary concentration of MEP in the 08 study. And you may want to just add in higher maternal urinary concentrations, just so it's clear that it's not the infants. Just adding maternal urinary concentrations of MEP. Then the weight of relevance to humans, this is another case where the animal studies are assumed to be relevant studies that we cited do not provide proof that it's relevant, but it's assumed to be relevant. Weight of evidence, experimental design, <clears throat> the two reproductive toxicity studies that I mentioned are both suitable for risk assessment. The single dose developmental tox study was not suitable for risk assessment. And then we left the question for you to flesh out for the epidemiology studies. Are they suitable for risk assessment? 
I would I would say yeah. I would say yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So I think we can. And regarding the replication end of this, the reproductive studies, yes, they were there were two different studies, two different labs. Developmental tox, no, it's not replicated. It's one one laboratory, one experiment. And the EPI, there are two different times. Is that considered replication of the same effect, or is it, it further it, documentation of the same? It's two thing? analyses from the same cohort with a slightly larger data set. So I, I wouldn't consider them independent because in the second analysis, I think there were 105 infants, the first 85, but the, the 85 from the first analysis were part of the 105. So no, not, not really replic replication or independent. So then we could leave it as it is. Regarding risk considerations, yeah. there, there's high exposure to this phthalate, so the answer is yes. From the, stand, from the exposure standpoint, yes, there is a high exposure. And what exactly to reference here was not clear, but the, we need to reach agreement on what are the best exposure data that we want to cite in all of these cases. So is it the is it the VERSAR data? Or is it biomonitoring data? Both. both. We need them both. I wouldn't call it enhanced data. I would call it biomonitoring data Bio because it's not only yeah. enhanced data, but based yeah. on our based on biomonitoring data. Biomonitoring and Aerial external exposure modeling. External exposure modeling. Right. Okay, so that's terminology that we should capture and use again. Mm -hmm. Exposure modeling data. Exposure modeling. External data. exposure modeling. Well, and that's not quite true because we give an internal, we give an internal value. It's not. You model you, you you mount, model the external to achieve the internal. So that so we we're using the external modeling to achieve an internal value. Pain micrograms per kilogram per day, you, you model external exposure routes and sources so that you come up with an aggregate or a cumulative exposure that you can translate to a, a dose to the body. It's, it's external modeling, I mean it's um, exposure modeling compared to biomonitoring. Yeah, but the externals where the, you get you get hung but up. Just say exposure modeling. If you do exposure modeling to achieve a uh, number of micrograms per, milligram to per kilogram per day, then I think that's a simple way of explaining it. Which one was high? It was high for D. This is D, right? DEP. Pardon me? DEP. DEP. Right, DEP. Then on the second half of the risk considerations being the hazard information that we've mm -hmm. gathered, it's, uh, it's unknown for developmental effects in animals because there is just that one single dose study. So it's, un it's uncharacterized or unknown right. in animals. Mm. However, there is the decreased AGD observed in humans, but the effects, and in addition, the effects observed in the reproductive studies are minimal. Right. Attempt to characterize the two categories of animal data and mm -hmm. the human response. The human response can't be ignored. Response is unexplained by mechanism. So you don't know the association that's real. The yeah, mechanism. So well, no, the mechanism no. of action. You're saying because in, in rats, MEP is not biologically active, or that it's a different it's because AGD is is a um, anti-androgenic response, which is what you would expect. Yeah. Phthalate, but you wouldn't expect it from DEP-based animal data. data. Right. 
It could be that the human, human the human data you're looking at could be a mixed exposure. Yeah, well, it is. So therefore, you can't you can't you can't tie it exactly to DEP. You can tie it to phthalates, but no, they measured the specific metabolites and then they put each one into the model. So they looked at the association. Did they do the aggregate? Yes. The and aggregate didn't come up with the one? No, the aggregate came up that it was stronger when you basically combine exposure to multiple phthalates. Which is, which I thought you said yesterday, so that I want. But by so stronger, I don't mean that the AGD was, sh was much shorter. These are odds ratios right. we're looking at, so stronger in magnitude odds ratio. Right, I understand that. Yeah. Um, but in terms of mechanism, you know, based on the, the animal data, DEP is is not thought to act as an anti-androgen. This, this is an interesting one. The reason why I'm, in, I'm trying to discuss this is goes back to my point about total exposure, but not only total exposure based upon source, but based upon total exposure to a variety of phthalates, some of which have a much higher uh, potency than others. Yeah. Yeah. But this, this can be easily dealt with. Uh, Okay. within the framework of, of the Bradford Hill criteria, that's this one biological plausibility. So, so we could argue that in this case it's, uh, it's not really fulfilled. Right. But no, again, this has to be always judged in, in context. You know, there are, um, if, if biological plausibility is not fulfilled, that's not necessarily a decisive criterion because in the past there have been many examples, for example, one from uh, from your area of expertise, Paul, with particulate matter, mm -hmm. where these associations between uh, particulate matter and cardiovascular disease were discovered, uh, but at, at a time where uh, there was no bi biological plausibility for that. Right. But I, this has emerged later. Right. So uh, you I'm, always have to be judging this very carefully. I'm not, I'm not discounting it. What I'm trying to do is, just like you are, we have to put these things into context of where we are in terms of evaluations, but when we make our decisions, we're using the best available evidence, knowing that in some cases, that well, maybe it's so, you know, it's fuzzy, it's too fuzzy for us to make a decision now, but more work is needed. I, and I think that's what, we're, what we'll cover in the, get to this part here. Mm -hmm. Don't we need a, the, something about the margin of exposure before we get to this? Or, The risk assessment considerations, could we have a Part C that does our best in terms of an, an estimate for a, a point of departure and an estimate for exposure, high level exposures or whatever? And I agree. And you know, actually, this is one case where once we get the data from the availability of exposures in children, you know, if it's very, very low, then this even is more of a, an issue in terms of what we have as our charge as to being something that is not consequential at this time. Because there is a higher exposure issue here, but it may not be, the source may not be toys. I'm trying to bring all this stuff in because we're going to have to explain this crap. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's a lot of confusion that can result if we don't, we we're not careful how we explain these things. And if we're trying to use this as a logical weight of evidence and a logical way in which to discuss, you know, our decisions, now I'm beginning to see how we can do this a little bit more strategically. I mean, if, if what you just said is true, I mean, you could then right here put a however exposure from children's toys is low. Inconsequential or inconsequential, whatever you want to use. I mean, you can modify. And then that helps us make our decisions yeah. better. Okay, does this work for you? I agree that it would be helpful to, to have the POD information and the MOE information in there, but these are kinds of terms of art among us. Mm -hmm. And I think in order for us to use them as a basis for our recommendations, we need to have a very good explanation of what is the point of departure? What does it mean? What are the criteria that are required to be able to select a point of departure as something that's meaningful as a basis for yeah. whatever we're going to use it for? And the same thing with the, the mar margin 
of exposure. But that's the, the previous discussion could actually each of the, the toxicology part, the epidemiology part, whatever, exposure part, could each end by saying with this information, our, mm -hmm. you know, we're in our consideration for a reasonable point of departure is, you know, with some right. evaluation of the quality of that. I or agree. Something. All, all I'm saying is that for readers who don't right. use part of departure thoughts every day, we have to have an explanation someplace in the report for what is the part of, what is, what are we departing from and what yeah. are we taking with us at this departure? But even with the point of departure, the actual data we have from mechanistic studies, the actual quantitative exposures that occur, the evidence from epidemiologic stu epidemiological studies, all will support the uns will, will have, how would you might say, reduce my angst in terms of the uncertainty around a point of departure. Because if these other things line up, let's say, high, 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 well, you know, it doesn't matter. The point is it's, it's there, it's real, or low, 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 or, and then the only, only place we will get into trouble all the time is when we have this confusion somewhere in the middle. And that will help us, those data, real data, or at least estimates will help us resolve some of those problems. Yep, I, I agree. And I'm just saying that when we use no oil, we define mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah. If we use POD and MOE, we need to define what they are. Sure. Or benefit of. Yeah. Yep. And that could be in the original strategy part of that inter the introduction that we're writing. Right. That's part of the 30 pages. Okay, on number five with the recommendation itself, my guess is that there's an inverse relationship between the clearness of the recommendation and the length of it. So this, this is a longer one. <laughs> it's not a yes or no answer. Factor. <laughs> the things to consider. <laughs> All uh, things considered a factor. <laughs> high the, the high levels of exposure, together with the decreased AGD measure in humans, raises concerns. However, the epidemiology study was not replicated, and adequate developmental toxicity studies in animals have not been done. What's not said there is that, therefore, there is no recommendation for banning. Right. But what we say instead is that, therefore, recommend, the recommendation is for further studies to help determine the risk of DEP to humans. Well, six, I think, covers the point you were just going to make, that no regulatory action well, it is does. recommended. It, it says there that there's no regulatory action. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a fine answer. Very minor point in terms of wording when you when you say because it could be misinterpreted when you say the epidemiologic to be epidemiologic study was not replicated someone could interpret that to mean another study was done it didn't mm. replicate mm -hmm. the study so oh. I would just write I mean someone could interpret it that way because when you say something's not replicated it means Right. However, oh, um, there is only mm -hmm. one epidemiologic study right. where can the I, data consists of. Can I ask a question of Russ? You made, we, we just discussed the issue that it was a total exposure issue, not just DEP, which led to, is there some place to put in that number five or somewhere in the epidemiology leading up to it? The point that you know this is a this was a mixed exposure in the epidemiological study. Well, in all of them, it'll it'll be a mixed exposure. So they'll measure you know six or eight or ten yeah. of the metabolites, and then they'll explore each one independently to try to see if there's an association. But you're correct that not only is MEP in the urine, but MBP, mm -hmm. MEHP, the, the oxidate, etc., plus other other exposures. Right. Um, I mean, the concern always in epidemiologic studies is, you know, even though you can statistically model it, so you just have your MEP predicting your outcome, it could potentially be a surrogate for another exposure that you either measured or didn't measure. You know, maybe in this case, pregnant women that use more cosmetics, personal care products also do something else different and mm -hmm. have a different exposure. Got yeah. it. Okay. So.
Okay, then number six, the wording will be changed to what we agreed to earlier. Uh, would this recommendation, if implemented, be expected to reduce the exposure of children? And the answer is that no regulatory action was, was recommended. I really like this approach that you guys implement. It really, it, it, for a person who's not a toxicologist, it frames the questions better for me in terms of how we proceed. And um, so I, I think this is really well done. Thank you for your help yesterday in arriving at a template. Because I, I think these will be looked at independently. It, it, people aren't going to necessarily read through every one of these. They're going to look at the one of most importance to them. So it has to be a freestanding piece of information. So just for the, the tox studies, so adequate developmental tox studies in animals have not been done. So um, I mean in talking to toxicologists in the field, they would they would say that DEP is not anti-androgenic. But do you feel that, because <clears throat> when you're saying adequate developmental, you're saying you, you can't determine yes or no if it's behaving through that mechanism, or do you think that there's enough data to say that it's not anti-androgenic? I guess what I would say is adequate based upon the criteria that we will have in the 30-page document as to what constitutes adequate developmental toxicity data. In other words, a study that has more than 20 animals per dose group, more than three doses or three or more doses replicated in multiple labs. Um, was to ask you directly, do you think based on the tox data, DEP is uh, not anti-androgenic in the same way that the other phthalates are, or do you just think that we don't have enough data yet to say whether it is or isn't? Uh, I think... Because <laughs> I know there are some toxicologists that would have um, a, a, a different interpretation, I think. The fact that they came from Earl Gray's data, I mean, you kind of said earlier, we do have the, the comparison to other phthalates. Yep. At least we could say it, if it is anti-endogenic, it's not as potent as others. Yeah. And that may be an important part. Um, I think that was what Polger kept referring back to yesterday with respect to the tox studies. I think, Rutz, the, the approach that was taken was justifiable. <clears throat> but there is still some uncertainty. Would 800 milligrams per kilogram per day have caused an effect? We don't know. If he had repeated this study at 750 in the same strain of rats, would we have gotten the sa exactly the same answer? We don't know. So there, it's a pretty good pilot study mm -hmm. for saying how should I spend my resources mm -hmm. and my animals, but it's not the definitive answer on... It, it, under challenge, was this chemical an anti-androgen? We're not making a statement on that. I don't think we can. Uh, two, two things for comment. Number one, uh, okay, the focus on anti-androgenicity is important, but in my opinion can't be the only one. There are potentially other effects by mechanisms uh, not related to anti-androgenicity, which also give rise to developmental or reproductive toxicity, which we need to take into consideration. So uh, the focus on an, an anti-androgenic mode of action is a little too narrow, in my opinion, so we have to bear that in mind. The second, which leads me on to a, to a consideration, what we could do is include uh, an additional criterion which, which simply is called mode of action. 
But um, I, I hesitated to suggest that yesterday, and I'm, I'm still hesitant, but I still uh, sort of put it up for, for debate here. It would um, give us the opportunity to reflect on, on this anti androgenicity put uh, considerations of biological plausibility in there, which would answer some of the points we discussed this morning. Um, it may be useful. On the other hand, uh, I feel at the moment that the framework as set out by, by you too will work and uh, it can live without this additional criterion of mode of action. I mean, are you suggesting, for example, considering effects on uh, gene expression in the absence of productive More effects? More to the point, for, for many of the phthalates we're, we're looking at, the question would then indeed focus on, on anti-andronicity or, or an endocrine disrupting mode of action. But I think, well, for obvious reasons, that's an important consideration for our purposes, but in my opinion, can't be the only one. There are pros and cons. So if we included this in our framework as an additional criterion, it would give us the opportunity to um, uh, consider biological plausibility, etc. You know, the, the points Paul raised a couple of minutes ago in, in a nice place. On the other hand, I think it can live, it can live as it is. I don't know, just an idea. Well, for example, the observation in the human studies of an alteration in genital distance. If, if we just said there was a, a male reproductive effect, I think we would be remiss because th there's a special trigger value to saying AGD is something that was caused by this phthalate. So I think we can bring it in in that way because the, what we're observing is related to a mode of action I think we need to have a, a place in the report where we talk about mode of action as it relates to this group of phthalates. And it becomes then a criterion for deciding which of these phthalates have this mode of action common to them and which do not appear to trigger this mode of action. I'm not sure that we should have a section to comment on it with each phthalate individually. That's why I, I, I hesitated uh, yesterday to, to include it and I didn't suggest it because it's, uh, it would on the one hand be a nice way, a nice box to put various relevant considerations but if mode of action is, say if we, you make the demand uh, the mode of action has to be endocrine, um, that's nonsensical in our context and if that criterion is not fulfilled, then nothing, there's no consequence. So therefore, I, I didn't mention it yesterday, but I think, yeah, on reflection, I've answered my own question. I think we should leave it out. <laughs> Sorry about this. <laughs> so we just got a brief uh, picture into the internal mechan mechanism of you deciding yes or no. <laughs> yes, you had a... Look in, into the abyss, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so have we finished the discussion of DEP? Hearing no further comments, Andreas, are you prepared to do DINP? Yes, I am. Um, do you have that on a PowerPoint? Or? No, 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 no. I haven't. Uh, the choice was either to do the weight of evidence or the DINP, but okay. in, a, in a break, I can quickly do that. Or later. So Shall it's we? time for a break. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> this is a point of intersection. Could we go over uh, the uh, the new chart for um, that added the uh, three other phthalates last night? Sure. Today? Because I think we should do that before we leave. Okay. Do you have that on the PowerPoint? We have everyone. Everyone has it now. I don't have from Versa, the Versa data to yeah, we for those last three compounds. Can someone put that on PowerPoint? Yeah. 